So we're in this series called Different. We're looking in 1 Peter. Peter actually says in this book, at the beginning of the book, he says this world is not our home. He says we're, we're, we're strangers in a foreign land. He actually, in one translation, it uses the word aliens. It's just not, you know, and basically he's saying don't get used to this place because this place is just kind of a stopping point into where you were ultimately created to be, which is in the presence of God. We're called to be different. Each and every one of us called to be different. Everyone say called. We're called to be different. And you know what? It's okay to be different. It really is okay to be different. It's okay to be the one that goes against the norm. It's okay to be that one that may seem just a little bit strange. It's okay. Sometimes I think it, it, it you know, in our minds we, we, we get this thought that, oh, I just, I, I don't want to look weird. I don't want to look strange. I'm just going to sit over here in my little hole in my little bubble and I'm just going to be, Ugh. But it's okay. If I ask you today, how many of you would be excited and overwhelmed with anticipation if you realized and actually heard exactly what God was calling you to do? I mean, you heard his voice as clear as you hear my voice right now, and you've been praying, God, what am I supposed to do? What am I called to do? I mean, seriously, how many of you, if you heard that in that moment, would be like, whoo! Because let's be honest, a lot of times in most of our lives we spend, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And we just don't, we don't hear it, right? Or we don't think we do. It's just like we don't get that clear voice. God, am I supposed to be here? Am I supposed to be doing this? Am I supposed to be doing that? God, would you just please, 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 can I just have one audible moment in my life? Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever prayed that? God, would you just please split the heavens wide open and let me hear your voice? What? Am I called to do? Today, we're going to talk about that and how God can and will call you, set you apart, and allow you to do something different. First Peter is full of common themes and common words. One of those words is the word call. He uses the word call or called or calling repetitively through this book, and as well as other themes, but we're going to focus on this particular theme today. Whenever you recognize that you've been chosen or called to do something, it builds anticipation. It builds an expectancy. It builds this desire or this, I mean, just this drive and this push to accomplish that, to empower you. Maybe it's like your boss gives you some cool new responsibility and you're the only one in the company that can do it and you're like, yes, I'm doing it. It's like it gives you this sense of, I'm worth something. I can do this. And then you put your all into it and you just work and you work and you work and you work and and you know what, you would just, I'm doing well. This is what I'm called to do. But I want to show you today that you're called to something different. And I believe when we talk about callings, there's three things that I'll share with you just really quickly about about three different types of calling. First of all, we all have the eternal call to Christ. Every single person that has ever took a breath on this planet and every single person that will take a breath on this planet is called to an eternal relationship or an eternal, you know, connection with Christ. It's just what's inside of us. You will pass around, not everybody, you know, not everybody's in church and not everybody's following God. I didn't say anything about everyone accepting that call. I just simply said that we're all called to that. Every single one of us, an eternal call. Because it's God's will that none of us should perish. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, he said, he, he being God, is patient with you. He's patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Everyone. Sometimes you hear people say, well, you know, man, people have been saying Jesus is coming back, you know, for years and years and years and years. You say, well, why isn't he coming back yet? Well, this is a verse that I go back to because he is patient. Why? Because he doesn't want anyone to perish. Now, there's going to be a moment, and I'm going to get all preachy here for just a second. There will be a moment when God looks at his son and says, it's time. And if you are a Christian today claiming to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have got to claim that. 
It is not something to be scared of. It is not something to, 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 to in fact, we're supposed to pray for Christ's coming. Diligently pray for Christ to come. And one of these days, it's going to happen. One of these days, it's going to happen. My grandfather used to slam that pulpit with his hand, and he would stand up there and he'd point, and he'd say, it could be today. I remember, I can remember him just, just over and over. It could be today. And you know what? It could be today. It could be today. Because he is coming for his chosen people. He's coming. And he wants everyone, everyone to come to repentance. And when Peter writes about this calling, he knew what it was like to be called by Jesus. See, there was a story in Luke where Peter was fishing one day and he wasn't catching anything. And here this guy shows up, this rabbi, as they called teachers of that day. And Jesus shows up and basically says, "Mm, not having no luck, throw your nets out on the other side. And so you got to think, you know, Peter, here's the pro. Peter's a pro fisherman. Like, he, he, he knows exactly what he's doing. And here comes somebody walking up and saying, man, that ain't working. Why don't you flip your net to the other side? Can't you just, can't you just for a moment picture yourself in Peter's mind going, man, I've been doing this for years, dude. You just need to chill out and go over here and teach, and I'm just going to fish. But he does, and he throws his nets on the other side, and he comes up with a haul that, I mean, it's so big and it's so huge. It's like, oh, my goodness. And Jesus stops and he says, hey, man, he said, I want you to stop fishing for them fish. Why don't you follow me and we'll go fish with men, for men. And in that moment, in that moment, Peter said yes. There was, and, and we read it, you know, and I read this one pretty definitively. There was no thought. I think Peter just said, okay, let's go. Let's go. And in that moment, that calling, you know, that eternal call to Christ, Peter accepted that in that moment. Jesus said, come follow me, and Peter went and followed. Peter knew clearly that we are called to leave our own desires and devote our lives to Christ. The second type of calling, and, and this is the one that we, we probably get excited about this one more often than not, but, but this is a temporary call to an assignment. A temporary call to an assignment. I was called to this job. I was called to be a captain of this team. I was called to go to this college and study this to prepare for this. You might feel like you're called to a particular role. You're called in, you know, to teach kids. You're called you know, to coach. You're called to, you know, to farm. You're called to pastor. You're called to whatever it be. It, it, but it's that, temp, it's, that, it's that temporary calling to an assignment. You say, well, Pastor Ron, you're called into ministry. Isn't that a life thing? Yes, it is, but it's still temporary. Why? Because this life is temporary. Because one day I'll stop speaking on this earth and I'll start kneeling on the next. It's still temporary. And there's nothing wrong with them. I think it's fantastic. Even in ministry, I have been called to different places. In different churches, with different church families. It's just a temporary part. Now, and I hope this one's not too temporary. I hope I'm around for a while. But, but, but even that, if God was to call me somewhere else at some particular point in time... Just like he called Peter off of that boat, it would be up to me to say, okay, let's go. I've had to do that before, and that's hard. It's tough. I remember when we were in Lebanon, God called us home, and I knew God was calling me home. He was calling me home to be a daddy. And I fought it for months and months, and Lacey and I would talk, and we fought it, and we finally just prayed, and we come together, and we said, you know what, we got to go home. And I remember when I told, I remember when I told my, my, my deacon board up there, because we were close, man, we had gotten close fast, and we were seeing some amazing things happen, and we were about to build this big, huge, multi-million dollar church, and our church was growing, and things were rocking, and I walk in and say, guys, I got to go home. And I remember that Sunday night, I had two of my best friends in my front yard threatening to whip my tail. True story. And they were both big enough to do it. I'll never forget. One of them just looks at I'll whip you to keep you here. I said, man, you're going to have to whip me. Because i got to go. I didn't want to go. But I knew I had to go. God was calling me to a different assignment. And that assignment had nothing to do with ministry. It had everything to do with my family. It 
It's temporary. But today I want to talk to you about a third one, and this is the one we're going to spend the rest of the day on. We all have a daily call to a different standard. All of us have a daily call to a different standard. If you claim to know Jesus Christ as your Savior today, you have a call, a daily call to a different standard. When we think of a calling, we tend to think of the do. What what am I called to do? But God starts with the who before he gets to the do. That's a Craig Rochelle quote. Love that quote. Just You guys, I use Craig Rochelle stuff all the time. He's saying he's just so calm and he's just so real. But this is just like right in your face. God starts with the who before he gets to the do. He's more concerned about me first than my ministry. Does that make sense? He's more concerned about you and your relationship with him than he is about your job. That's just who God is. He is concerned about me. It's just like like a daddy with his kids. I'm more concerned about my kids and and who they are and that they're taken care of and and all of these different things that I teach them. I'm a whole lot more concerned about that than what they're going to go out and choose to do in life. What career path or what college that they go to. That's just something that's inside of me. God starts with the who before he gets to the do. Or God is more concerned with who you are before he's concerned with what you do. Because if the who's not right, the do will never be right. God's concerned about motives and heart and integrity. So when you know who you are, you'll know what to do. When you know who you are, you'll you'll know what to do. When you know who God has created you to be, when you figure out exactly what that masterpiece that, that, that God says in Ephesians 2.10, or that Paul writes and says that God created us to be a masterpiece, when you, when you know who you are, you will know why that masterpiece was created. You'll get it. You'll, you'll understand it. See, Peter was writing to a group of first century believers that would have been tempted to forget who they were. Remember a few weeks ago when I talked to you about how they were persecuted so bad? I mean, so bad. Just thrown out in the street and, you know, thrown in cages with, with, with wild animals and just basically eaten alive or tied to trees and, and then set the tree on fire and then they would have this big party around while you burn and the tree burn with it. That's who he was writing to. They'd be tempted to forget who they were because they were so hated. You think that Christians are hated today. And by the way, in many instances they are. But it's still nothing compared to the persecution that that first century believers were under. But this is what I know. Satan will use the situation and circumstances around you to try to make you forget who you are. He will use situations. He will use circumstances. He will use broken relationships. He will use the words of others, the actions of others, whatever it may be. He will use that to try to to get you confused in your mind and make you forget who you are. And he's pretty good at it. 1 Peter 2.9, Peter says this, and I've said this three or four times already this morning, for you are God's chosen people. You are God's chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. You are God's chosen people. Let me say that again, in case you didn't hear me the sixth time. You are God's chosen people. He chose you. It wasn't by chance or by circumstance or just by accident. He chose you. Maybe you say, well, I can't believe he chose this. Yes, he did. He chose that. He chose you and all your mess and all your junk and all your mistakes. He chose you. Every single one of you. God's possession. For those of you who are followers of Christ... You have been chosen to be in God's family. See, that would have meant so much, so much to these first century Christians because they had such a respect for the priesthood. To be called royal priests, that was a place of prominence, a place of, 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 of meaning. And so for Peter to write to them and say, you are royal priests, that was almost like you know Peter was giving them a moment to where they could kind of puff up just a little bit and think, yeah, I am. I am that. I am God's. 
the fact that they were filled with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead called to make a difference in this world. But not different alone. They were called to do it together, a holy nation. They were called to do this t- together. It's part of something bigger, something broader. People belonging to God, their bodies weren't their own. They've been purchased with the blood of Jesus. They belong to God. And six, they belong to God. They're under his care, his goodness, and that is who they are, and that is who you are. Now, some of you this morning, as I continue with this for just a few minutes, you're going to struggle claiming this. Sitting in your chair right now, and some of you already are struggling. You're already struggling with with, with this, man, I'm God's chosen. God chose me. Ain't no way God chose me. Yes, he did. So battle through the struggle this morning. He goes on to say, as a result, because you're a priest, you can show others the goodness of God. When you know who you are, you'll know what to do. And then what did God do? For God called you of darkness into his wonderful light. We've been called, we've been chosen, we've been invited. No longer in darkness, but to step into the amazing things that God has for each and every one of us. Lives transformed, lives changed. We're a new creation. The old is gone. Brand new, something different. We've been transformed by the love of Jesus, set apart, and called. See, Satan doesn't want you believing that you're God's chosen. See, today there's a skeptical world today that looks as, at followers of Christ. And again, maybe we weren't quite persecuted to the extent that the early Christians in that first century were. We're not getting tied to trees and burned. But come on, if you claim to be a Christian today, you know why Christians are so silent today? Why some are so silent? Because Satan has got into their head and told them that they're weak. So they claim that weakness. Because society or culture, and maybe not here because we live in Bible Belt USA, and, and, and we're kind of, you know, we're, we're, we think sometimes that we're just in this little safe place. Come on, it happens here too. It's just a little bit different. But if you claim to be a Christian in Ava, Missouri, you're still part of a Christian in this world. And all across this world, what are Christians looked at today? Can I just be real and honest and bold and just speak truth for a minute? Because honestly, when words like what I'm about to say come out, that's why we cause ourselves to kind of step back. And that's that window that Satan will come in. Because when you hear that Christians are are nothing but a bunch of racist bigots, that all they care about is themselves and they're selfish, that they don't care about other people, what does that make you want to do? Well, I want to be a part of that, and I want to claim Christ, but I'm just going to step back over here, and I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I'm just going to be quiet. Topics comes up, or issues come up that, 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 that you know what, the world and culture and society are just so loud, and, and in the middle of that loud voice, Christians get criticized, and they get their feet cut out from underneath them, and, and can I just be real for a second? I think a lot of the reasons that the church is in the situation that it's in today is because we have taken a position and a stance of silence on a lot of issues that should... And I'm not saying everyone, and I'm not saying every church. But when the wrong message and the wrong voice becomes louder than the right one, which is the one that gets heard the most? Well, I'm about to step in it. I know I touched on this the other day, but as your pastor and someone that loves you, I'm going to get pretty bold for just a second, and I want you to listen to me because I love you. And I'm going to get real. People that are struggling with life, you're going to struggle with life because life sometimes is a struggle. But dadgummit, God is the answer. Not taking something into your own hands. Do you hear me? I don't care if you're a teenager. I don't care if you're a young person. I don't care if you're an adult in this place today. Life sucks sometimes and it gets hard. But there's always an answer. And that answer is Jesus Christ. There's always an answer other than doing something to yourself. You hear me? Because we're called to be different. And can I? Let's just keep going. 
That has to be the message that is louder. And the only way it gets louder is because that's what we choose that message to come. And not necessarily by what we speak, but as we'll talk about in just a minute, by how we live. It's the example. It's that decision. You know what? I'm called to a different standard. God called me to be different. God called me to preach different, to play different, to sing different, to teach different, to coach different, to live different, to track different. He called me to be different. I'm chosen to be different. I'm wound up today. I ain't preached for two weeks, so just deal with it. Doug, I'm sorry. I'm spitting all over you. <laughs> it's the world we live in and we have to wrestle with today. And tragically, there's some so-called Christians who have earned. Listen, it's a reality. Some people earn these titles. Oh, mm. You can just look at current events, people spewing hate in the name of God. God's message is not a message of hate. It's not. Yeah, sometimes gets, God gets hard and he gets firm. But there's nothing hate tied to it. But that voice, Satan uses that. Uses against ourselves, uses it inside our churches. And this is the image that, we, that we're up against. And, and, and Peter's going to say the same thing to these first century Christians. Man, this, you're, you're called to be different every day. To represent Jesus in a skeptical world. So if you want to know what you're called to do, I'm going to look at a few verses. You'll know who you are. You'll see what you're called to do. Peter says in verse 11, dear friends, I warned you, as temporary residents and foreigners, there he goes again, temporary, this world's not your home. He says, I warn you to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Everyone say among. That's important. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. I love what he said. He said, live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Notice Peter doesn't say here, hey, first you have to convince them to believe like you do. He didn't say that. He didn't say that we had to go out there and beat them over the head with the Bible, try to make them believe what we believe. He said, live among them. Live among them. Listen, Christian today, well, I'm preaching to Christians today. That means I'm preaching to myself. We're called to be different. But we're not called to be better than someone else. You be the best that you can be. But don't you ever look at yourself as being better than somebody else. Why? Because the Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We all make mistakes. We all fall into holes. We all, come on. See, what he says to them here is we're going to show them what we believe and how we behave. We're going to live honorably. And I believe with all of my heart in today's culture that there are times that we need to just start professing the name of Jesus. I do. It needs to be spoken from our mouth and it needs to be spoken boldly. But you know what I think would change a whole lot of things today? Simply, and I believe as a church we do a really good job of this. We're not perfect, but I believe we do. I believe we need to step up in how we live it, probably more than how we say it. Because if we're saying one thing and living something else, all we're doing is causing confusion. And the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. So if confusion is being caused, it's not on God, it's on us. We're called to be different every single day different so often we just need to earn credibility by treating people with love treating people with respect with grace before we even earn the right to be heard we need to show people what we believe by how we behave and that builds a bridge across the skeptical people I want to share a story with you just really quick and you know what, Lance and guys, if you want to come up, I'm going to blast through a couple things. Saturday morning, 
about 2.30 in the morning, to be exact. Brett and I had fished a tournament this weekend and did really well. We pulled out, and, and I won't say who it was because I want to respect him. It's not my story to tell with his name attached, but I'm going to tell the story. Good friend of mine, someone that serves in this church very regularly, recently called to a different temporary assignment. It's a stressful environment. I'm just working in a prison. We were loading up and getting stuff ready to go, Brett and I was, and, and he walked over, he'd loaded up, and he said, can I, can I just share a testimony? And I said, absolutely. And this was kind of uncommon for him anyways, but he said, he said, I was at work the other day, and he said, I was just walking down, and he, and he said, one of the inmates said, asked him, said, are you a Christian? And, and he said, yeah, I do my best to try to be. Inmates that I can tell. And he said, well, how can you tell? He said, because you treat me different than everyone else does. Woo. Tears started welling up in his eyes as he was telling me this story. And that's another big deal that doesn't happen with him usually. It's because he lived it. He's not perfect treated people right and he loved people people that most people don't treat right just to be really honest living it changes it only changes you it changes other people you're called to be different you're called to love different we're called to serve different we're called to to give differently to give grace and but you know what most people they just want to criticize Find every little thing that they can nitpick about this and that and this and that. and Man, it, it, it just, oh. What's something that eats me? You think, you think I get criticized as a pastor? Yes. Our church gets criticized. And I'm not the only one. You go talk to any other pastor, any other, you, you, we just, it's part of it. You get criticized. Sometimes you get criticized by people you never think would criticize you. What well, hurts? But it happens. But unfortunately, that's the route that most people take. They're just looking for that moment, that instant, that thing. And that's the path that gets chosen. And then what happens is we just kind of we just kind of hunker down and we just kind of we we just kind of put ourselves in this bubble and it's just like we're just in this defensive mode and and you know Satan's just punching and and listen you got to play defense sometimes good defenses win championships but I don't care if you can't score you ain't winning coach would you say amen I played for Coach Mark Windler Mark play, he wanted you to play as hard a defense as you possibly could playing on that basketball floor you got down and you got after it but he wanted you to shoot the ball. Because if you couldn't shoot the ball and put it in the hole, you couldn't win. It's the same thing. You can have, you can have one of the best defenses, but you've got to score. And we've all heard it said sometimes the best defense is, is, is a good offense. Right? Sometimes you've got to step out of your bubble thinking, you know what? Oh, this, is, this could hurt. And you've got to get out of that thing and you've got to get on the offensive just a little bit. You've got to step up and live what you're saying. Maybe sometimes you got to say what you live in. But just sitting back here, just taking punches, man, that's going to get old. Because you can only protect so much. Even a good boxer, you know what? You either protect your face, you protect your body, but if you live one of them, you say, well, I got my head protected. You ever get punched in the, in the rib cage and the kidney just over and over? Even just light taps. You don't have to get hit hard. Just, mm, mm. it's going to hurt eventually. You're going to weaken and you're going down. Step out. Some of you need to step out of your bubble today. Some of you are scared to step out of your bubble. But as your pastor and someone that loves you, get up and bust the thing and get on the offense. Be different. Be the person that you're called to be. Let's keep going really quick. Verse 15. Live properly, he says, live properly above. 
among your unbelieving neighbors. And then verse 10, verse 15. Here's God's will. It's God's will that your honorable lives should silence the ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. There's a verse to take home with you. Doesn't say by your words. Doesn't say by what you say. Doesn't say by being critical. Doesn't say by going and putting some big long post on Facebook. It's trying to share what you want to share and get your point across. It says by how you live. How I live. Listen, I know I've preached on the whole social media thing before, but I'm going to preach on it again for just a second. So listen. Don't put your junk out there. If you've got a problem with someone, go talk to that person. You hear me? Go talk to that person. Don't put it out there so everyone else that's hiding behind a computer screen and drawing their strength from, you know, being in a room by themselves and not being in front of that person. Go talk to that person. That's, that's strength. That's courage. Come on. We're called to be different. We're not called to get sucked into that. I've been sucked into it before. I have, but I try hard not to be. Hard. Why? Because I just want to live different. It's not that I'm bitter. I just want to be different. I want to show people that there's a different way. That there's a different a method that you can handle, and you can handle anything. Next week, I'm going to, be, I'm going to talk about being different in persecution. Don't miss that one. Because what happens, when, man, when we persecute you, we want to jump up and throw, don't we? We just want to, come on, let's go, let's go. You say, well, Pastor, you just said a good offense. Hey, I didn't say nothing about stepping back in your bubble. Different play, you don't run the same play every time, do you, coach? You got to run some different things, don't you? But it's always to move the ball forward, correct? You don't ever want to be stagnant or lose ground. You want to go forward. Sometimes you got to run a different play. Sometimes you got to do something a little bit different. Sometimes the best offense is just simply zipping it. Yes? Some of you are like, oh, man, I'm... No, just keep living. Keep loving. Keep serving. Keep giving. You know, our church has been criticized before. It's okay. Because I'm just going to keep pointing people to a real relationship with the real God. And my prayer is that this church keeps doing the things that God has asked us to do the way he has asked us to do them. And I know that I'm right because I talked to my buddy down the street, buddy, going through some of the same things. It's it's inevitable. We call each other, text each other every week. We go through the same things. That's how we're connected. Had that spoke over us one time. We are so connected. Still, after all of these years of not ministering together, we're still ministering together. We're just running a different play. Oh, I feel that. And I needed that in that moment. Because I miss him. I miss him. But we're, we're, we're just different right now. We're on this temporary call. To just, just be who you are, where you are. And in this church, that's what we're going to be. We're going to keep loving and serving and giving. I don't care if we talk about it. Let's just live it. Don't walk out of this church up here. Well, Cross Point Church just loves people. And that's why we do love people. But I would much rather you walk out of this church and actually love someone than tell someone we love them. Cross Point Church is a given church. You bet we're a given church. But let's keep doing it with our actions. Peter goes on to say, if you live honorable lives over time, you may just silence the people who make foolish acquisitions against you. And then verse 21. For God, God called you to do good. That's your calling. What am I called to do? To do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. And then in verse 20, just continuing, and he says, He, Jesus, is your example, and you must follow any steps. Whew, okay, I'm about done. Jesus was never arrogant, never condescending, never rude, never proud, never defensive, never hateful. The sinless Son of God who loved the unlovable. And showed grace to those who were offensive. And this is how Peter described him. And I want to leave you with this this morning. Verses 22 through 24. Listen to these words. Don't just read them on the screen that's up there. Would you just please just listen to these. He says, Jesus, that that he never sinned. He never deceived anyone. He didn't retaliate when he was insulted. Nor threatened revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God. Who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on that cross that we would be dead to sin and live for what is right. That. That. The 
Son of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And then Peter goes on and shows how we're called to be different. We're called to be different in a way that, honestly, we just can't really imagine, just to be honest. See, he said we're called to be good, but we're not just called to be good to just certain people. If you skip over to chapter 3, verse 9, he says this, don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Repay them back with a blessing. This is what God has called you to do. Okay, let's pray. God, thank you for this day, for all that you do and all that you are in our lives. Thankful, God, that you're a bold God. Also, God, that you're loving of grace and mercy. Challenge us and teach us today. Speak to our hearts, God, because we are God's chosen people, and I truly believe that someone in this building today needs to hear that and claim that. In Jesus' name, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to say a couple more things, but I want you to think. What are we called to do when someone asks us to go a mile? Jesus says we go two. Someone asks for our shirts, we give them our jacket. When someone curses us, we bless them back. When someone hates us, we pray for them and show them love. Because we're called to something different. We are called to something different. You are God's chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. A people belonging to God. Therefore, you are on call to love when someone needs love. To give when someone has a need. You're called to be different. called to be different. God gives us eyes to see the needs of the people in this world. He gives us a heart to care for those who are hurting, ears to hear those who need it. When you know who you are, you'll know what to do. God called us to be a blessing to people, a voice of encouragement, a positive presence in your office, not just messengers of gossip, but of messengers of hope to build up people. Our best defense is a good offense. Show love, live love. When they laugh, show love. When they criticize, show love. When they get in a war on social media, we're above that. Just show love. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. This morning, 